not a frustrated person at all. I have a feeling of, uh, if I may say so, of a certain satisfaction with the opportunities I've had in life. And uh, so I have no sense of frustration, but uh, undoubtedly there's a feeling of loneliness which creeps upon one. I always thought that there could be rather more than almost that feeling for many people who are sensitive. And it's a curious thing how in the middle of a crowd, I'm one of the crowds that get apart from it. <laughs> I'm Arnold Michaelis. Here in India, the big question hanging over this house, the official residence of India's Prime Minister, is just who is the next occupant of this house going to be? Whoever fills this post is not, unfortunately, going to be able to fill the role played by this quixotic, delightful, and to us Americans, sometimes irritating, but always charming man. What is the essence of Jawaharlal Nehru? This lighter side is a lesser known facet. But the world's appraisal abounds in contradiction. As the leader of the neutrals and the non-aligned, as the pilot of India's endless millions, he has been characterized as everything from a saint to a devil, from a democrat to a dictator. <laughs> Nehru, among world's leaders, is the philosopher-politician, a combination to which his detractors attribute an aloofness, a lack of candor, an intellectual snobbishness. But here at his official home in New Delhi, this aristocratic Kashmiri Brahmin has periodically escaped from the pressures of the Prime Minister to his cherished role of father and grandfather. His daughter, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, and her two sons have provided the family atmosphere for Mr. Nehru since the death of his wife in 1939. He has given to his grandsons in person what he gave to his daughter in writing throughout his nine years in prison during India's fight for independence. The rewards of this 30-year struggle came on August 15, 1947, as the last British Viceroy, Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, read the proclamation which gave birth to the new Republic of India and brought an end to the 200 years of British rule. No other father in all history educated his daughter through letters from prison. For Nehru, prison provided the enforced leisure in which he wrote much of his autobiography in memory of his wife, Carola and where his thoughts live with those who most influenced him, his wife, of course, his father. India's greatest poet, Rabindranath Tagore, Albert Einstein, George Bernard Shaw, Abraham Lincoln, and his teacher, friend, and beloved leader, the immortal Gandhi. Independence brought not only rewards, but unimagined violence and tragedy. And the greatest tragedy? the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. The manner of his death, said Nehru, was the culmination and perfect climax to an astonishing career. The message he embodied will endure and grow in the understanding of man. We miss profoundly the living fire that was in this man of peace and humility, this man whose eyes were often full of laughter and yet were pools of infinite sadness. To us who knew him, Nehru said, he will remain a radiant and beloved figure who ennobled us and gave us significance to our petty lives and whose passing has left us with a feeling of emptiness and loneliness. As with the Pitts of England and the Roosevelts of America, the Nehru's of India were quite at home on the center of the world stage. Nehru's policy of neutrality in the Cold War and independence in the conduct of international affairs made him one of the most sought after of all the world's leaders. He offered friendship to all, regardless of differences in policy. To his critics, this made him appear slippery, an unprincipled operator, or a naive politician whose weakness and inability to choose the side of righteousness would destroy him. He was pleased with the exchange of friendship with Zhou Enlai, 
and baffled by the reaction of many in the West. But at the Bandung Conference in 1955, this friendship was strengthened, and as a result, Nehru used India's meager funds to build the country economically instead of militarily. But in a country paved with centuries of poverty, progress is scarcely felt. As Nehru said, the burdens of the past pursue us. Sometimes we feel vital and youthful and full of energy. At other times, thousands of years weigh us down, and we feel old and a little weary at this long and interminable pilgrimage. Both are a part of us and make us what we are, and out of that ceaseless intermingling and conflict, something new is always arising. They're all mixed up. The new and the old. And the uh, want to retain part of the old and replace the rest with the new. I noticed particularly in the agricultural area uh, that you are still concerned because India, being essentially an agricultural economy, still has to be dependent upon imports of food. That is so. That worries us a good deal. Could we want to be um, depend not dependent on food from abroad? I think we shall be in a few years' time. Do so you think you'll be independent? I think so, yes. She'll produce quite enough for our own purposes and a little more than that. Have you found that the farmers generally have shown an increased tendency to change old methods? I, I know that there had been a difficult problem with you in the past. That is a real difficulty. We have uh, many ordinary ways of increasing the yield, but how to induce 300 million people to do that is a problem. I think they are getting used to the new methods, and uh, that, will, that will lead to greater production. But Mr. Nehru, one of the things that I know has plagued you and plagued India uh, has been the, the problem of the uh, birth rate, the rise in the population, which has a tendency to negate whatever advances you make agriculturally. That is so. Of course, all our health program negates it. We have uh, practically put an end to malaria in India, typhoid largely, and uh, people are eating more generally. The result is, in fact, that the the food shortage is due to people eating more to some extent. And people are, uh, they dress better, so what? All these things are inevitable, and we want them to happen, eating more and dressing better and all that, but they come in the way, and the population increases. So we are trying our best to have family planning and birth control and all that. Have you been encouraged by any progress in that direction in recent yes, months? Uh, yes, the progress is definite. It will take some time to yes. show results. But uh, the results in India, in India it's so big and vast, although we are doing a good deal. It, is, uh, it doesn't cover the whole picture. <laughs> Of course, you can say that, on the other hand, it provides you with manpower, which which has its value, providing you can find ways of harnessing that power. Provided, it is. It's not easy to harness the huge manpower of India. We are trying to. But a good deal, taking agriculture, what can be done by a few persons, only is done by the three times that number. 
is not usefully employed on the higher employment, it's underemployment that we suffer from more than actual employment. I suppose every country wants the welfare state because it wants welfare for its citizens. But uh, we can't do that at present because however much we may produce, the tendency is for what we produce to accumulate with some people, not to, to go out to the others. And so difficulties arise. The gap between those who have and those who have not increases. Yes. We want that to disappear. Well, of course, the concentration of the haves versus the have-nots, traditionally and historically, uh, is what must have prompted Marx to write his manifesto. Marx considered these problems well over a hundred years ago, when the world was very really different, when there was practically no effective governmental control of the, by the people, like the, 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 the idea of democracy had spread so much. So I suppose he thought that no change could be brought about except by violence. That is not so now. Democracy gives a method of changing. Also, his, uh, his idea that the difference will grow between the rich and the poor, and the poor will become poorer and the rich richer, has been falsified by many things that have happened in the United States, for instance, and other places too. So that was, uh, although Marx did have a great deal of vision, and many things that he has said has turned out to be true. Many things that he said have turned out to be not true. And I suppose I have used the word somewhere that they are the metaphysicians of the new age. And it intrigued me <laughs> to, to, to find that you applied the term metaphysician to the, uh, to the communist. I suppose I did so, thinking of them as uh, persons who are always arguing ideologies and, uh, and uh, theoretical applications of what will happen in theory, regardless of fact. The reason it interested me is because of the tendency in some areas, some quarters here in India, uh, to uh, underscore the renunciation of life. Now, I realize this gets into very long ideological and philosophical uh, areas, but uh, uh, renunciation of life doesn't square with fact either, does it? No, it can only apply to, to individuals, not to large groups. And uh, I suppose the whole idea of renunciation is good after certain, uh, after certain basic necessities are, are supplied, are met. Today, the idea of renunciation to a poverty-stricken people is absurd. Of course. Except when I was I think they're very little left. Yes. Well, I would represent a minority of thought. And, but you have many minorities of thought here in India. And indeed, uh, the basis of partition in 47 was key, wasn't it, to that division of minority? Yes, it was. It was based on religious minority. And, uh, there is other, other things also added on to it, mainly religious minority, who were afraid of uh, India becoming free and they remaining a minority. They didn't like that idea at all. Well, now you and, and uh, Mr. Gandhi and Mr. Jinnah, you were all involved at that point, uh, well, before the point of independence and then partition, in the fight for independence of India from British domination. Mr. Jinnah was not involved in the fight for independence at all. In fact, he opposed it. The Muslim League was, an, was a, started 
1911, I think. It was started really by the British, encouraged by them so as to create factions in our ranks. They did succeed to some extent. Then ultimately, they came the partition. Now, had you and Mr. Gandhi been in favor of that? Mr. Gandhi was not in favor of it right to the end. Even when it came, he was not in favor of it. I was not in favor of it either. But ultimately, I decided, like others did, many others, that it is better to have partition than this constant uh, trouble. And uh, you see, the, the leaders of the Muslim League were big landlords and the like, who did not like land reform. We were very anxious to have land reform, which we did have afterwards. And that was one reason that we agreed to partition because we thought that if they remained with us, apart from this trouble continuing, they would oppose our measures, many of our measures, and we said it's better to have a part of India and go ahead with our program of reforms, etc., than to be tied up with those leaders who would uh, come in the way of these reforms. And yet you would have many, many centuries of, of fraternal living with the Muslims here in India, hadn't you? Yes, many hundreds of years, and uh, on the whole there were fraternal living. Occasionally there was trouble, but on the whole there was. It was a religious concept, more than anything. The Hindus were not, and are not, a proselytizing race. They didn't care very much what the other party did. Mm. While the Muslims were uh, keen on proselytizing and getting converts, in fact, all they, nearly all the Muslims in India are descendants of Hindus. The only handful came from outside. So they did actually uh, succeed in proselytizing. Well, they did, only to a small extent, relatively small extent, about less than a quarter of the people, after hundreds and hundreds of years of this. How many Muslims are there now in India? I uh, don't exactly know, but over 50 million. Well, that makes you, what, the second or third largest yes. Muslim state? It is the third largest state. Well, it's very hard for an outsider to understand that as the basis for partition, Mr. Nehru, that there would still that there would still be 50 millions or more uh, Muslims in India if, if indeed the separation between Hindu and Muslim was the basis. How could you separate them? They live in every village. It's not one compact area where they live. They were, the majority was in what is Pakistan now. But in every village all over India, there are Hindus and Muslims living together. It meant a tremendous uprooting of all these people. That was one of the objections to partition. Well, now you have that in microcosm, don't you, in Kashmir? No. Not in that sense, because in Kashmir, the majority was and is Muslim. But it's still a mixture. It is a mixture, but the majority in Kashmir itself, in the, in the valley of Kashmir, the, the Muslims are a great majority. And yet, the state, which was one of the princely states, acceded to India rather than to Pakistan. Yes. The accession took place when Pakistan invaded India. Or rather, Pakistan helped people, the tribal people, to invade India. Oh, you mean that part of India, uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir? Yes, Jammu and Kashmir. And, uh, the people of Kashmir resisted this invasion. That is, the, not only the 
the Maharaja who is there, but uh, the others, the, uh, the, the National Conference, which is quite apart from our National Congress, resisted it. That is, the Muslims resisted it. The Muslims themselves resisted it. resisted it. And uh, then they asked to be a light to India. And uh, both the Maharaja and the National Conference there. And we agreed. It was before that. It was uh, doubtful which way they had turned. They agreed and then we had to send some troops there to defend them from these tribal raiders. And uh, for about a year, 14 months or so, this thing went on. Then there was ceasefire. Now at that time, Mr. Nero, was there any talk of plebiscite for the people of Kashmir? There was no talk as such. I declared that, uh, I don't think I used the word plebiscite, but uh, that, that the people of Kashmir would decide this, whether, which way they will go. Then, in spite of that, uh, they of Pakistan then rejected that to begin with. Rejected the plan? Rejected it, yes. And then the ceasefire and all that, and the UN came in and they produced a resolution which did mention the plebiscite. And they, and they stated various steps that should be taken before that took place. Among the steps was the Pakistan troops should be withdrawn from Kashmir. Only we, India, had to reduce our numbers because they accepted the fact of uh, accession to India and said we, we, we would be responsible for law and order and all that. Who would be responsible? India would be responsible for law and order, therefore should keep some troops there, though they would be reduced. But ever since then, Pakistan has not withdrawn its troops from that area. And because that was not done, the question of plebiscite did not arise then. And uh, after waiting for a year or two, then Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, had uh, uh, wanted to go ahead with their constitution. They formed a constituent assembly elected by the people of that area. The constituent assembly confirmed the accession to India and uh, made some reforms, land reforms, etc., which were fairly far-reaching. We have now we have had three general elections in the last dozen years or so, and. Uh, the assembly there has been elected by a franchise by all the people, and they are functioning there. Later, the elections were held late, later under the auspices of our election commissioner here to see that they were fair. Because our election commissioner is well recognized. He's not a under the orders of government, he can do things what he likes, more or less the president appoints him. And uh, ever since then, they've had autonomy in their state, which they have now, and uh, they carry on the government of the state. Why has India consistently refused to plebiscite in the last number of years? Well, to begin with, these general elections that we've had there three times in the last dozen years are themselves kind of plebiscite. Secondly, in a plebiscite or even elections, if people are allowed to come there from Pakistan, hordes of them would come across to Kashmir as it is. And, uh, it will be difficult to, to keep them there as it is. There's a tendency for them to come over 
because economic conditions are somewhat better on this side than on the other. And uh, we are little afraid of the consequences of uh, such an expression of opinion because it will probably not be based on political or economic factors but purely on religion. And the result may be disastrous in Kashmir itself and in the rest of India. Well, uh, how do you mean that, Mr. Nehru? Well, I mean, if they uh, vote on the basis of religion, then uh, people of a contrary religion will be pushed out or will be afraid of continuing there. There will be migrations as they were originally between India and Pakistan. And uh, that would uh, create trouble in both countries. If the division was to take place, Hindu and Muslim, then the Muslims in numerous villages of India and towns and villages will feel rather unhappy. I mean, say, they won't feel uh, as full citizens of India. Now, they are treated as full citizens. Is, uh, are they represented in the government? They are represented. Our vice president is a very eminent Muslim scholar. In our cabinet, there are two Muslims. Other members are also in the government. And uh, uh, there are ambassadors are Muslims. So uh, in our army, there are plenty of Muslims, office, Muslim officers. In the top echelon? I'm not sure how many there are, but there are some in the top echelons. And uh, you see, this partition was an extraordinary thing. It uh, separated families. Now, there are plenty of people in India uh, with their relatives on the other side and vice versa. We have uh, ambassadors, our ambassadors, Muslims are our ambassadors abroad. Their brothers are ambassadors of Pakistan. And the army too, same applies. Some generals here, their brothers or cousins are on the other side. Well, Mr. Nehru, Kashmir is, of course, the crux of the difficulties between India and Pakistan, but it isn't the only difficulty between the two countries. How do you see the problems between you and your neighbor resolved when the tensions seem to be so high? Well, they don't seem to be lessening, quite the contrary. We have suggested several times that we should have a no more declaration between the two. That will not solve the problems, but it will produce an atmosphere which is uh, better able to, to deal with these problems. But Pakistan refuses to have a no more declaration. On what grounds? I don't know. I suppose they think that if they have a no more declaration, it means freezing the situation as it is. We have told them that nothing is frozen. We we go on discussing it, but we will not solve it by war. This is any problem. We can go on discussing any problem we may have and come to decisions about it in other ways. I know that you made a visit to Pakistan in the last number of years. I happen to be popular in Pakistan <laughs> before or two, before partition, and now, in fact, uh, my mother came from Pakistan. Oh, did she? From what city? From Lahore. See, from Lahore. My childhood, I went to Pakistan many times. Now, another great difficulty is that Pakistan has a uh, uh, some more or less, but with uh, China. Pakistan's close association with China or the frontier, it's, uh, in, the, in the frontier treaty that they have made with China, they have agreed to a portion of Kashmir, west of the park, being uh, handed over to, to China, which they had no business to do. That is, according to them, if Kashmir is still unsettled, they had no business to, to do that. Well, now, the Chinese action, of course, was a great blow to you, I know, because you had counted on the power of friendship which I know you felt you expressed to the Chinese, and indeed were criticized by many quarters of the world, including 
my own countrymen for maintaining this spirit of friendship. Why do you think the Chinese acted as they did, Mr. Nano? That is more than I can say why they acted that way. But uh, for several years before last year, when they actually invaded in a large scale, our relations had become tenser and tenser. In the dark, they gradually crept in, creeping in. Why they did it last year, I suppose, principally, they were annoyed with us because the Dalai Lama is here because about 30,000 uh, refugees had come from uh, Tibet and we had to give them shelter and we were helping them. And principally because they wanted the Asian world to realize that they are the top dogs in Asia. And uh, any person, any person, any country that is in Asia should remember that. And there has been an ebbing and flow, a flowing of Chinese power down through the centuries. Yes. Do you think they have something of a superiority complex? They have very much that. that they have always had it, even they are not strong, even then they have had it. They consider all the others well, uh, as uh, uncivilized compared to themselves. But what do you do about a power with the potential of China? In the nuclear age, one collision will be inevitable unless they're contained. How do you deal with that? <laughs> we have to deal with it by strengthening ourselves to avoid such a collision and to meet it when it comes. Do you feel that you can develop your own military power in time? And in regard to the to the distance of our frontier from the central China itself, I would say. There's a problem with logistics for them to bring to Tibet, to our frontier, uh, everything from a distance of several thousand miles. And we have, although it's difficult terrain for us, we have not so far to go. So we can defend ourselves. We don't tend to, to, to invade China, because yeah, that's, that's entirely opposed to our thinking. But we can stop them from coming to India. Well, now if the superiority complex maintains and their strength increases, not only vis-a-vis -vis India, but even in the nuclear direction, how do, you, how do you see any possible containment of them in the future? Do you think the United States and the Soviet Union, along with India, would be able to contain them? I can't say it look far into the future, but they are dangerous from that point of view. And uh, I suppose the immediate problem is one of food for their people. Australia, Canada, and other places. And their population is increasing at a rapid rate, more rapid than ours. Yes. That is a problem for us, which is much more so for them. And possibly these difficulties will uh, make them more peaceful. Well, in spite of the invasion, in spite of their intransigence, you still favor their admission to the United Nations? I do, because I think that their isolation, uh, first of all, you can't have, let us say, disarmament, any agreement or disarmament with China out of it. That is obvious. And one of the major issues, I suppose they will tone down somewhat in the future, especially if they're at the UN. Now what has happened today, many Western countries like England, France, and others are developing trade contacts with them. Are you in favor of that? Well, I'm not, to be quite frank. I don't like these countries and their trade contacts. They would uh, favor China. But, uh, 
I don't want the Chinese people to to die of hunger. But that's what I was coming to. And I, I knew that you would had to say something along that line, Mr. Nero, because that's the example of your life. Yes. But I don't want any material, no material to go to from other places. And as for they're becoming strong in the nuclear age. As a matter of fact, I don't think that uh, we are more advanced to India in atomic energy than we are. Really? Only today, I signed, uh, I was present at the signing of, uh, of an agreement with Canada. On what basis? And we are building a civil uh, station for atomic energy to, to be used for uh, civil purposes. A few days ago, we signed another agreement with the United States the same for another station. And we have fairly good, very good young men who are doing this work, young scientists. They're quite brilliant, some of them. So the only thing is that we are determined not to turn this into, for all purposes, not to use nuclear weapons for all purposes. We don't make atomic bombs. <laughs> I don't think we will. Is anybody's guess what might happen if China had them? Anyhow, that will take a long time, even if she got one originally uh, to begin with. She'd have to, uh, to have them in sufficient quantities would take many, many years. For How do you feel about the present relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union? It's uh, certainly better than it was, and uh, I hope it will continue that. And will gradually develop further context with each other. What effect does this then have on the so-called neutrals throughout the world? I, I say so-called because I know you don't like the word neutral. I should say they approve of it. There are most of them, I don't know about everybody, most of them like it. Because ultimately, war and peace depends today, big war and peace on the United States and the Soviet Union. The nuclear war, I mean. And anything that uh, lessens the danger of a war of that type is to be welcomed. And this does lessen it. Do you think that that lessens the necessity for another Bandung conference, which has been given prominence in recent days? The Bandung conference, if it was held today, would uh, not succeed as all the first one did because there are too many points of difference between the countries that would come there. The other conference that is suggested is a conference of non-aligned nations. Such as the Belgrade conference. Such as the Belgrade one. That certainly better. It has more contacts with each other the countries would have. But to that, well, I, I, I think, exclude China and Pakistan, who are not non-aligned. Well, that's why I wonder what, what effect you think Pakistan's alignment with China is going to produce for her as a neighbor of yours. I believe she stated that even if the Kashmir problem was solved and China attacked you, she would not come to your defense. Yes. They said something like that, that even the Kashmir problem and other problems with India were solved, even then they would uh, continue their friendship with China and not, uh, not help us to face China. And between uh, the two of you, since they refused to sign a no-war pledge, mm. it certainly extends the atmosphere of, of unfriendliness, if not potential conflict, and yet any kind of armed conflict between you and Pakistan would really have the gravest repercussions for both of you, wouldn't it? Yes, undoubtedly it would. We hope that will not happen. 
So sometimes President Trump passes also. But uh, still, see, their, their whole mentality is based on fear and hatred of India. Now fear and hatred both are very undesirable things to have. And uh, they first relied on the Western countries to make them strong so as to meet India on the battlefield, you might say, when they found that that, uh, that went far, but didn't quite go as far as they wanted it to go, well, then they turned towards China. And I think President Ayubha said in some places that he was sorry he didn't take advantage of the moment of the Chinese invasion of India to, to attack India. And yet you still feel that you must press and continue to press for a peaceful, peaceful solution of these problems. Yes, we have to, and uh, Pakistan being what it is, uh, India and Pakistan have to be friends, have to cooperate as independent countries. Because uh, remember that throughout history, the area that is Pakistan, much of it, was not... Uh, a separate country. I mean, South India was, but North India and Pakistan, geographically, hist historically, linguistically, they're the same language as we have here. Yes. Culturally, there are so many common things. And it's just foolish for uh, this tension to continue between the two of us. And I think it's bound to go down. As a matter of fact, from the people's point of view, there's not too much tension. Our people go there, they come here, they are welcome there. But they talk about old friends and all that. It's more a political thing at the top, occasionally made worse by religious issues being brought to bear upon it. But as, as the, do you feel that there is any personal enmity between you and President Ayod? I have none, but he has recently said many times that I am coming in the way of India and Pakistan being together, being, I'm saying, cooperating. There's no question of a personal enmity between us. I have many friends in Pakistan. They come here sometimes, we meet them, friendly way. Mr. Nader, in 1958, when I came here to make a film with you, the first thing we talked about was your retirement, because you tried to retire in the summer of 58, as you remember, and the country wouldn't let you. And I asked you then if you were going to try again, and you said you had no plans for retirement at that point. Does that still hold? More or less, yes. I have no plans, but I suppose... I can't go on indefinitely. You seem to be. <laughs> but how do you feel about the stewardship of India beyond your term as Prime Minister? Well, somebody will come on, take it. Not a fact, it's a... Uh, if I nominated somebody, as people seem to expect, that is the shortest way of his not being that. <laughs> people be jealous of him, dislike him, <laughs> and just like Winston Churchill, more or less nominated, uh, what's his name? Uh, Anthony Eden. Anthony Eden. He didn't last long. It's best to leave it to the people then who can choose, they can choose. <laughs> They naturally choose within a circle of the people who are uh, close, to, close to us. It's not possible, apparently, to think of India without you at the helm. Well, people will have to think of it anyhow. Well, people, people do think of it, and they, they, they continually wonder about successor. But particularly in the press in the United States in the last number of months, there have been so many recurring reports to the effect that your daughter, Mrs. Gandhi, 
is being groomed as your successor. And that's a fascinating thought. It may be fascinating for some people, but as a very unlikely thing, I know that she uh, doesn't want to turn to help. I'm certainly not doing that for anything. <laughs>